Professor Dave and Chegg here. When we first discussed solubility, we learned that some ionic compounds are water soluble and will completely disperse in solution due to the ion dipole interactions they will make with water molecules. We also mentioned that other ionic compounds are water insoluble and will not dissolve at all, remaining completely in the solid phase. Beyond this, if the components of such a compound find each other in solution, they will precipitate and leave solution completely to form a solid. This is actually a slight oversimplification, and for our purposes, we will need to have a slightly more sophisticated and quantitative understanding of solubility. So let's revisit this concept now. It's true that many ionic compounds are completely soluble, but the reality is that even the ones that we call insoluble will dissolve to a minuscule degree. Whatever the degree to which dissolution occurs for a particular substance, we can communicate this using the solubility product, abbreviated as KSP. Let's look at a substance like silver chloride, which we label as water insoluble. As we said, if there is an excess of it in water, it will dissolve to a tiny extent and cause a dynamic equilibrium. Some ions dissolve as other ions rejoin the lattice. Just as with any other type of equilibrium, there must be an equilibrium constant to describe it, and that's the solubility product. As we might guess, this will simply be equal to the product of the two ion concentrations in solution, each raised to the power of their stoichiometric coefficients, which in this case is simply 1 and 1. Notice that we do not include the solid itself in this expression, as we do not include solids in equilibrium expressions. The smaller the constant, the fewer the ions that will be present in solution, and therefore the less soluble the substance must be. And compounds that are extremely water insoluble will have KSP values on the order of 10 to the negative 30, negative 50, or even smaller. Let's make sure we can write these solubility products for various equilibria. Take something like calcium carbonate. First, we must write out the complete equilibrium. Upon dissociating, this will form a calcium ion and a carbonate ion. Therefore, the solubility product will be equal to the product of these two ion concentrations. If we have something like magnesium hydroxide, it's the same thing, except that dissociation produces one magnesium ion and two hydroxide ions, which means that hydroxide ion concentration will be squared in the solubility product expression. We can even do this for something more complicated, like apatite, which is a mineral. This will dissociate into five calcium ions, three phosphate ions, and a hydroxide ion. So the solubility product expression will look like this. In this way, a number of ionic compounds that we previously deemed insoluble should actually be categorized as slightly soluble. If we have a way of measuring ion concentrations in solution, we can calculate the KSP value for a given substance. Let's say we have a saturated solution of milk of magnesia, which is magnesium hydroxide. This is slightly soluble and dissolves according to the following equilibrium. Say we measure the resulting magnesium ion concentration, what will be the solubility product for magnesium hydroxide? First, let's write the KSP expression for this substance, which we derived earlier. Notice that hydroxide concentration is squared due to the coefficient in the equilibrium. Now, if this is the concentration of the magnesium ion, then the hydroxide ion concentration must be precisely double, since there are two hydroxide ions for every magnesium ion in this substance. So all we need to do is plug these two concentrations into the expression, evaluate, and we will get 2 times 10 to the negative 13 for KSP, which will be a unitless constant just like other equilibrium constants. We can also go the other way around and predict the concentrations of ions that will result in solution when dissolving a substance with a given KSP. Let's say we place copper 1 bromide, which has a KSP of 6.3 times 10 to the negative 9, in aqueous solution, which will then generate copper ions and bromide ions to some extent. What will be the molar solubility of this substance, meaning how many moles per liter of the formula unit will dissolve? To find this, we can write the solubility product expression and use this to construct a simple ice chart. In this, we will not list any values for copper bromide, as this is a solid. The ions themselves will start at zero. The change will be x because of the 1 to 1 to 1 ratio, and this means that the equilibrium concentrations of the ions will also be equal to x.
Therefore, the KSP will be equal to x squared, and x will be 7.9 times 10 to the negative 5 moles per liter. This is the molar solubility of copper 1 bromide, which in this case is simply the concentration of copper ions and bromide ions in solution at equilibrium. This can be a little trickier if the KSP equation involves exponents, but the process is essentially the same. Let's look at calcium hydroxide, which has a KSP of 8 times 10 to the negative 6. Say we place this in aqueous solution, which will produce some calcium ions and hydroxide ions. Again, let's write the KSP expression, noticing that the hydroxide concentration must be squared, as there will be two hydroxide ions for every formula unit of calcium hydroxide that dissolves. Then, when we make the ice chart, we will notice that again the initial concentration of each ion will be zero, but the change will be x and 2x respectively, due to the stoichiometry of the equation, and the equilibrium concentrations will also be x and 2x. Putting these into the KSP expression, we get that the KSP will be equal to 4x cubed. Now solving for x, we divide by 4, and then take the cube root, leaving us with 1.3 times 10 to the negative 2 for x, which will therefore be the molar solubility, which we can interpret as the solubility of the solid expressed in moles per liter, or the moles of the solid that will dissolve per liter of water. So we know that solubility is defined as the maximum possible concentration of a solute that is possible in a solution at a given temperature and pressure. We also know that solubilities can be quantified by using solubility product expressions. These constants are equal to the product of the ion concentrations, each raised to their stoichiometric coefficients. That means that if we have a way of recording ion concentrations in solution, it will be a trivial matter to calculate KSP for a given substance. Let's say we have a solution of fluorite, which has the formula CaF2. This is slightly soluble and dissolves according to the following equilibrium. If we have a saturated solution of fluorite and we measure the resulting calcium ion concentration as being 2.1 times 10 to the negative 4 molar, what will be the solubility product for fluorite? To answer this, we will want to write the KSP expression for this substance. But before we do that, let's notice that the fluoride ion concentration must be precisely double the calcium ion concentration, since there are two fluoride ions for every calcium ion in this substance. That gives us a fluoride concentration of 4.2 times 10 to the negative 4 molar. Now let's write out the expression we need. First, let's notice that fluoride concentration is squared due to the coefficient in the equilibrium. So all we need to do is plug these two concentrations into the expression, and we will get 3.7 times 10 to the negative 11 for KSP, which will be a unitless constant, just like other equilibrium constants. Let's try another example. This time, let's calculate the molar solubility of silver chromate, given that it has a KSP value of 1.1 times 10 to the negative 12. So even though we are going the other way and starting with a KSP value, this won't be that much different. Once again, let's write out the KSP expression, making sure to realize that silver ion concentration must be squared due to the coefficient in the equilibrium. Now for this one, an ice box will be useful. The initial concentrations of the ions will be zero, and then the change will be 2x for silver and x for chromate, again due to the stoichiometric ratio, and these will be the equilibrium concentrations as well. Now plugging those back into our expression, the KSP value must be equal to 4x cubed. So solving for x, we get 6.5 times 10 to the negative 5 molar. This will be equal to the chromate ion concentration in solution, and doubling this would give us the silver ion concentration. This x value also tells us the molar solubility, as it represents the moles of the formula unit for the solid that will dissolve, since one formula unit gives us two silver ions and one chromate ion. With that, we have enhanced our understanding of the concept of solubility. That which was previously thought of as totally insoluble is actually very slightly soluble, and we should now be able to answer different questions regarding solubility products and molar solubility. Professor Dave for Chegg. See you next time.